Hello guys, welcome to my next Monday Bygel episode. My guest is Enrico Francesconi, who is a research director at National Research Council in Italy. And he's been for a few years a president of International Association of Artificial Intelligence and Law. Enrico, it's great you could join me. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for having me here. We are discussing AI and law, and you are one of co-authors of uh, the report we have prepared together with Michał Araszkiewicz, the first global report on impact of artificial intelligence on legal business. You commented uh, the results of, of the survey, and you have mentioned uh, that law firms are not fully aware of a potential of AI tools uh, in the legal domain. Why do you think so? Well, actually, uh, I think most law firms are using uh, tools for uh, mundane and uh, repetitive tasks mainly. But uh, there are lots of uh, developments in the AI field for uh, more advanced applications like document processing or in legal reasoning. It's understandable that law firms are more uh, focused on different kinds of things. Maybe we can distinguish between small and medium law firms. In medium law firms, there is more interest in uh, information for uh, the people working there. So this is probably the reason why small law firms are more focused on uh, a specific task. We asked uh, 203 law firms if they use AI and over the half of the law firms answered they use AI already. There are, of course, companies that are up to 10 people and there are firms that uh, employ over 1,000 employees. Uh, we didn't actually ask how deep they use AI or for which tasks. We, we ask them generally for some categories, but you may be right. Maybe you can comment on that uh, a bit. Well, actually, uh, as I said, uh, probably uh, they are trying to use AI just for a very specific task, let's say clerical errors, for example, or, or very specific problems. But uh, in, uh, in AI and law, you have uh, uh, more advanced features for like, for example, uh, automatic summarization of documents uh, or tools that allows you to implement a reason in terms of predictive justice that can be of interest for uh, lawyers to know a possible outcome of a case. Or there are applications in alternative dispute resolution or online dispute resolution, which might be uh, of interest for uh, this kind of uh, approach, uh, not to go directly uh, on a court. Probably more uh, interesting aspect is related to the advanced legal information retrieval that allows, um, for example, law firms to uh, or lawyers in general to access uh, documents uh, either in uh, legislative settings or uh, in case law setting for uh, retrieving documents of interest for their cases. And this can be maybe a closer application that we can, uh, we can foresee. This is what I wanted to go deeper. In Braga, uh, where we met uh, during conference of International Association of AI and Law, you presented a paper on identification of legislative errors, and you um, also work on legal information retrieval and legal compliance checking. So, yeah. so my question is how good we are in these methods, these processes. Are we prepared to, to have tools in, in these fields? Uh, uh, I think that um, we are in a good stage because the field of uh, research represents a, a combination of the application of semantic web technologies uh, uh, to the legal fields, for example, for implementing uh, AI legal reasoning. Uh, and in particular, in my research, I have worked uh, mainly on what is uh, generally called law has code. So transformation of the law has processable code, which can be, according to the uh, semantic web uh, perspective, understandable uh, by humans and by machines. So that basically also machines can uh, process legal uh, information. And this can be applied in transformation of the law in terms of uh, uh, provisions, uh, which are basically a portion of legal text uh, that uh, uh, can have a specific semantics like obligations, uh, sanctions, uh, permissions, uh, so on. Or norms. Norms basically are the application uh, in on legal cases and on state of affairs of uh, uh, such uh, uh, provisions. So that you can say that if uh, a case uh, you are compliant or not uh, uh, with uh, with the actual uh, regulation. So basically. 
this is the field where uh, I'm mainly working, and we have um, obtained good results uh, in terms of uh, implementation of these standards for improving the accessibility of legal text. In particular, legislation, but not only, also uh, on uh, on cases. There is a field of uh, uh, in AI law community very promising called e-discovery, which is particularly of interest for law firms in uh, in common law countries uh, where mm-hmm. they have to uh, access previous cases uh, to have support for argumentation on new cases. So basically, what is important uh, to implement in this kind of reasoning is the fact that uh, you can not only access uh, to uh, explicit provisions within legislation like explicit uh, obligation or explicit permission, but also uh, this ca- the um, provisions that are not explicitly expressed. Maybe they are expressed as rights of the counterpart, which are actually obligation of, uh, of uh, the addressee of a specific uh, provision. This is actually the, the way how you can improve the accessibility of a text. And how good we are in identifying all these <laughs> rights, obligations from general provisions. I had a discussion with Andrew Blair Stanek, who checked how good ChatGPT or GPT-3 was in uh, interpreting U.S. tax law. And he said that not more than 70% of good results. It was half a year ago. So maybe uh, AI has developed and improved. But how good we are in these methods you mentioned? Uh, look, there are basically two aspects that you have to deal with. Uh, the first one is uh, the so-called top-down approach. So you have to model, to provide models, knowledge models that allows you to describe such uh, provisions in a proper way in a knowledge organization systems that are usually called ontologies that allows you to implement reasoning facilities or to have a way how to express queries to the system in an effective way. And the other one is the bottom-up approach, how to instantiate such models so that uh, you can basically extract from a legal text specific uh, provisions. So there are two elements that have to be combined to have a global approach to this kind of problem. And we are in a good stage in terms of a model. So the general architecture of the knowledge models are, uh, are already there and are working pretty well. The other part, it's actually what is called uh, the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. So how can you instantiate those models in terms of actual pieces of text. And in this case, machine learning or natural language processing can have an effective uh, outcomes. And in particular, uh, recently, in uh, specifically in natural language processing with the advent of uh, transformers or uh, deep learning large language models, this kind of uh, techniques have, have provided very good results in this kind of uh, of, of things so that uh, we are in a phase, uh, let's say, in which uh, there are lots of expectation, but we had also a very good uh, uh, results. So we are at the edge of a uh, revolution, I would say, because you can think about a system that allows you to provide uh, legal advice uh, in, a, in a proper way. So that basically, uh, at some point, maybe you can have a legal chat GPT or, uh, or something like that. So a consultant in, in terms of legal matters. And do you know any examples of application of, of these methods in law firms or maybe in offices uh, or by other authorities? <laughs> They are mainly in terms of studies for now. In our community, we have uh, two main uh, conferences, uh, the, the European one, which is URIX uh, every year. And every two years, we have ICAIL, a more international one. Uh, we have uh, actually lots of work in both of these fields. So the bottom-up uh, knowledge modeling and bottom-up approach, so knowledge uh, extraction. Uh, but they are mainly at the level of research studies. What is important, I think, is that uh, the results we have obtained are very promising. There are lots of activities, preliminary activity, I would say, particularly in the public sector uh, and uh, particularly in the national institutions like the parliaments uh, that are aiming to uh, transform legal materials, in particular legislation, into 
processable code. There were in the past uh, several uh, projects in that respect in different uh, uh, European parliaments. In Italy, uh, we had uh, a very uh, interesting project which was called Norme in Rete, which means legislation in the, on the internet, basically, that uh, aimed actually to implement semantic web uh, standards for legislation. Another interesting project uh, is developed by the UK in the website uh, of uh, where they published the legislation. They uh, tried or they actually uh, succeeded in implementing semantic web standards uh, according to the so-called linked data approach uh, so that you can access uh, documents in a, in a proper way and uh, Moreover, they are uh, these data are reusable for additional uh, different applications. So I think these are best practices and are actually preliminary research and uh, actual works for uh, preparing data in a way that is amenable for computation, legal data in particular. Another thing that I would like to mention is uh, Eurlex, uh, which is the main access point to European legislation, is dealing with data which are actually machine readable coming from the so-called mm -hmm. uh, seller repository. Seller is the main repository of legal data in particular, European legislation. And uh, they are implementing uh, semantic web technologies and uh, proper ontologies uh, for describing European legislation. No, oh, it's it's great uh, that you mention all these examples. Uh, I think the legal business or legal tech business is now rushing and trying to copy the same apps like document generators on and on and is not aware of the things you do uh, in uh, international association of ai and law and all these research centers so it's good to create a bridge between um, research world and business world or legal world uh, to make uh, both sides aware of their needs and uh, their advancements and developments it was one of the tasks why we started the the report on uh, impact of AI on, on legal business. It's great you joined my podcast. Thank you for all these informations you, you revealed. It's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for, for your kind invitation.